everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna be going through the importance of the Reba stages. So the Reba stages were first introduced by the Royal Institution of British Architects. They had come up with a plan of works which sort of broke down the project into various stages. It has now become widely adopted in the UK and is used across multiple disciplines. I think up until last year, all the engineers were still using the architecture version of the Reba stage plan. The problem with using it is that it wasn't very specific to what um, a structure engineer needs to produce at various stages. Uh, and this was kind of fixed, I guess, when the iStructi published their Reba stage plan. And this is something which I'll be kind of roughly going through in, in this video. So stage zero and one, I don't think a structure engineer really gets too involved. You might get a little bit involved in stage one when you're kind of looking at the sort of site constraints and maybe preparing a small report for the client just to see what kind of surveys that they need. But I think generally you probably won't be involved at all. I think stage two, which is what I call the sort of scheme stage or the concept stage is the most important part of the project and it's probably personally my favorite part of the project. Why I like this stage the most is because I feel this is where you get to sort of showcase your ideas and this is where you can have, I think, the biggest impact on the success of the project. Generally, stage two is going to be before the planning application gets submitted, although sometimes you can be appointed after the architect has submitted the planning application, which personally I don't really like. I prefer to be appointed before that because I think you can make um, a big enough impact that you can actually sway the planning application in a certain way. I think the scheme stage is a very important stage to sort of catch and highlight any really important risks or hazards. As far as sort of deliverables go, I would expect for most of my projects to produce a sort of structural scheme. And this would be developed after having sort of some discussions with the architect, like to and throwing with some ideas or options. I would also be producing what we call a basis of design report. And this report is kind of captures the structural solution and also highlights the risks, the constraints and also what kind of additional survey works you need to do to progress into the sort of the third and fourth stages. So moving on to stage three and this is what I'd like to call like the first stage tender and for this stage I'd be expecting to produce a whole set of drawings like proper drawings and maybe even a 3D model. I'd also expect that a lot of the sort of structural solutions have already been ironed out and confirmed and is very unlikely to change. What I'd also expect is a lot of the sort of the calculations to have been done already. So like I mentioned earlier, that you'd probably be producing a model and this is probably where you'd be sharing models with the architect and mechanical electrical engineers, sort of coordinating your designs. But I think the key point of this stage is submitting your information for the contractor to tender. It's really important that you get the right information in your drawings or in your reports. It's okay that you make changes later on, but you need to make sure that in your drawings or reports that you completely highlight all the assumptions that you've made and to sort of alert the contractor or alert the person tendering for it that they need to make some allowances for some unknowns. Allowances could be something like reinforcement rates. It's gonna be very common at Reaper Stage 3 that you won't have done the full concrete um, frame design, so you're not gonna know exactly what the reinforcement is but you're gonna have a sort of general idea of what the reinforcement rate is. So you need to make sure that you put the rates down for, I don't know, like a beam, a slab, column, a wall. You need to put these rates down so that the tenderer can put a price to it. There may be things which you don't know yet, and you're probably not gonna know until the contractor gets on site and actually starts doing some opening up works. And this is totally fine for refurb projects. And all you've got to do is just to make sure that you flag it up on your drawings that you don't know what this is, you expect something to be here but it needs to be surveyed it needs to be opened up first so you need to make sure on the drawings that you tell the contractor to make some allowances for it it also means that if you were expecting a structural beam to be there but it turns out it's not you've kind of covered your back by saying this is what you've assumed but you don't know it's going to be a i guess an engineering judgment guess um, but at least you've kind of covered yourself. I think a lot of engineers can get caught out by not producing a good enough tender set of information and then sort of at stage four, they start adding a lot of more sort of information that wasn't gonna be originally priced by the tenderer. You also need to make sure that your basis of design report, which I mentioned in stage two, gets updated and issued as well, because I think it's a very important document which kind of highlights all your assumptions and kind of, it's almost like a line in the sand document 
to show where you are at this stage and if anything changes majorly like structurally if they decide you know all this time you've been going down a steel frame route and then all of a sudden the contractor wants a concrete frame you've got something that, to fall back on like no no, no we've been working on a con like a steel frame all this time and now suddenly you want to change the concrete frame now you've got grounds to claim for sort of additional fees so it's really important that you keep your reports up to date so next we're moving on to sort of stage four or what i'd call detailed design and in a design and build contract where you're going to do a two-stage tender this is going to be really really important that you get pretty much construction level information in your um, drawing issues in projects with just a single stage tender you'll just be progressing your design and making sure that your sort of design information is up and ready for construction stage as a design engineer this is the stage where you really get down into the nitty-gritty details of the calculations when you're really finalizing that analysis model and really looking at sort of the details maybe looking at like the connections between beams and slabs and columns and walls this is where you're going to be really looking into those sort of finer details. This is also going to be the stage where if you've got a concrete frame this is where you'll be producing reinforcement drawings and schedules as well so that they're going to be ready for the contractors to sort of just bang and order them. Again you need to remember to update your basis of design report and make sure you highlight any sort of residual risk which you can eliminate in your design. Alternatively create a designer's risk assessment which really highlights all the major risks um, that the contractor definitely needs to know when they go to sign. So stage five, construction stage. A very, very exciting stage or part of the project, but it can be also hugely stressful. So on some projects where it's particularly complex and tricky, you'll find yourself doing a load of work on this stage. Depending on the complexity of the project, you might find yourself having not much to do, or you have so much to do that you'll be answering site queries every day and probably going to site every once or twice a week. If you're a junior engineer, I would try and take the opportunity to go to senior, to go to site and get a lot of experience. It is really, really satisfying to see what you've been designing on paper come to life. Why I say this stage is very, very stressful is because if it's a very complex project, you're going to be getting RFIs fired at you left, right and centre almost every day and RFIs need to be answered pretty quickly. Because of this, you're gonna to have to figure out some way of slotting in all these RFIs into your probably already busy workflow, um, which is why when I have a lot of um, projects on site is um, I sort of block out a couple of days every week of just answering site queries so that I'm not seen as overly free to take on new projects. I found that if you do a very, very thorough job in Reaper stages three and four, the sort of construction stage work is minimized by a lot. You know, if you've done a lot of coordination and you've, you know, done the right amount of work, you can really minimize the amount of site queries that you get. On some projects though, it is gonna be inevitable that you get a lot of site queries. Any complex site, refer projects, yeah, you know, you're gonna be blasted with RFIs for a long, long time. As you find yourself answering more and more RFIs, um, you'll be needing to update your reports or updating your drawings, and it will come to the point where you get no more RFIs, and, and that's when you need to start issuing a as-built set of drawings or a final construction set of drawings. So generally, like stages zero and one in six and seven, there's not really that much for you to do. You may be asked to write something in the building maintenance manual, but hopefully your basis of design report is up to date and you can just issue them that and they can just stick that in the, in the manual. Sometimes you may be asked to do some snagging or if a snagging list has been done, you'll be asked to com comment on them. It's also a very good time after the project's ended or after the project's been built that you sit down with the design team and the contracting team to do a sort of lessons learned. It's a great way to sort of review and sort of reflect upon the project and just see what kind of things which you've learned together on the project and hopefully all the things which you've learned you can sort of take on to the next project so that you don't make the same mistakes. It's also going to be a great way to sort of continue building relationships with the architect, the client, the contractor, just anybody involved in the project. Engineering is very very small and you know you'll find yourself working with the same people over and over again so it's always going to be a great opportunity to sort of keep building relationships. When I was a graduate, I didn't know what the Reba stages were. So I stuck a really small copy of it in the Red Book, 
just so that I have a really quick reference to it whenever I kind of just need to refresh myself on what stage we were at or what I needed to do at a certain stage. I put it in the red book because the red book is basically constantly with me as I've talked about in other videos. Because the red book is with me at all times it just made sense to stick the references there for quick and easy access. Anyways, hopefully you found this video useful. Please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers!